the history of a country, there were some people who stood up for what was right, for what needed to be said, and did so with remarkable courage. Remember when the communists came into power in Nepal, talking to some of our young Nepali friends, I said, one thing we have learned, do not trust the communists. Never turn your backs on them because they don't believe in truth. That's a very important point. They believe in their truth, not truth. They will tell you what is necessary to get power. But our friends at the Sam Reddy Foundation stuck to their principles. They were not afraid, although they were cautious and prepared for the worst. And during that period of communist government, Robin, Arpita, and the whole uh, Sam Reddy team showed courage, always had their eyes on the goal. They worked with journalists very carefully, media, television, radio, to explain to them how to explain the benefits of freedom to the Nepali population in terms normal people can understand. And they won. They averted what could have been a horror, a genocide, a catastrophe. It did not happen because of the team assembled by the gentleman who's about to address you. Please come across. sharing his first hand sharing. I'd also like to thank the Atlas Network for this wonderful opportunity to share our efforts in the Liverpool movement. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as some of our friends here in the room might recall, on May 28, 2012, I wrote an email and sent it to some of the closest friends of Liberty, some of whom are present here in this room today. I've written it amidst a very disturbing political situation in Nepal when we almost slipped into a communist dictatorship just after having recently come out of centuries long feudal monarchical regime. I must say, it was a very desperate situation. It had been four years since the Maoists had come into mainstream politics by, you, by you winning the largest block of seats in the first ever constituent assembly elections. The ethnic divide fueled during the decade-long guerrilla war by the Maoists was going out of control. The parliament was dissolved by the prime minister who was, an, who was one of the supreme Maoist leader, and we had all reasons to believe that the country could be turned into a totalitarian communist state any time. The important question here is, why did the Maoist win almost a majority in the parliament in the constituent uh, assembly elections in the first place? Well, I think a bit of background would be helpful. Uh, with the fall of the Berlin War, uh, uh, Nepal also transited to a multi-party democracy in 1991. But in 1995, a small hardliner communist group uh, declared a guerrilla war, saying they were not happy about it state of affairs, and they claimed to have uh, their willingness to liberate the people and establish authority of the proletariats, like you saw. A series of events took place during this time. The economy was badly hit. Almost one third of the young population fled the country. Um, and that's that's why it's difficult for, for us now to get a visa in Hong Kong or any other country. It's, it, it's, it's, it's the repulse then. Masses abandoned their houses and moved to urban centers for safety. Mobility was a nightmare, and most of the private enterprises were captured by the Maoists through their labor unions. Murders and killings were in the headlines every day, and the Maoists had declared a parallel government and started levying taxes and mobility licenses. So the Nepali Maoists became a success story and a ray of hope for all the uh, Communist Party around the world. What contributed to their success was partly the preceding feudal monarchy and, and the poverty that lived under, under it 
which was very fertile ground for the communist seeds to take root. Fact is, the communist cloud has always hovered over Nepal since the political consciousness of democracy made way in the early 50s. The ideas of Marx, Mao, Lenin, Kim Il-sung, etc., were supposed to emanci emancipate people from the feudal system of the monarchy. Communism, people were told, would give them representation and rescue them from poverty and subjugation. Even this state, with much, with much persuasion, mediation, and political efforts, the Maoists agreed to a temporary peace in 2006, and the condition being that we would hold the Constituent Assembly elections to write a new constitution of the country, which they assumed would come in their favor. And, and therefore, therefore, in 2008, we had the, when the election took place, um, to the surprise of all of the political forces, we thought that Maoists wouldn't be voted. Maoists were voted against party in, uh, in the Constituent Assembly. But there were, there were people who genuinely thought Maoists would do something good for the country because they had brainwashed masses of people during the Gorilla War. But there were also people who were given a choice to vote or take a vote. So, so, so people voted. Um, other major political parties um, were in the parliament with the Maoist were, or still are, the United Marxist Leninist Party. The Congress Party, which is socialism as one of the one of its core principles. So it's basically a socialist party and there are, there are multiple ethnicity based parties in, in, in the country. So the bottom line is it was challenging for my colleagues and me to stay hopeful when the communist ideals are becoming so mainstream. But I also think that's when we stood strongest because that that year we really came out in public and started our public operations. Obviously, being an overwhelming left inclined society, open discussions about liberty and economic freedom generates only frowns, but also hostility. So we chose to trade slowly, in a subtle way, and strategically. We strategically approached with something that's practical and difficult to ignore. First of our uh, approach being using entrepreneurship as, as, as a phase to go out in the, in, in the society. Even though it was difficult in the beginning when entrepreneurs and business people were largely perceived as profit mongers, our previous uh, speakers shared their, their survey and research, which very much justifies it. But in the past six years, we were able to generate so much discourse around entrepreneurship that today, even aid money is being forced to channel towards creating entrepreneurship or enterprises in the country. Our initiative, including an award-winning student outreach program called School of Economics and Entrepreneurship has produced more than 500 graduates who have actually gotten into becoming, a lot of them have started becoming entrepreneurs. But what has been more interesting to us is looking at the traction of students into entrepreneurship programs, three university courses have started in entrepreneurship and there is an MBA on entrepreneurship now. So it's become a mainstream thing now. So we, we think this was uh, th this is a great success for us because our, what we wanted to do with much difficulty in the beginning, now it's taken, it's gone out to the public. In all of this, our focus has always been in translating the message of liberty into really local terms and everyday life situations of the party people. In 2011, when the communist parties were defining democracy as per their convenience during the constitution drafting process, and we are slowly leading the path towards a totalitarian constitution. We launched a campaign to stress on some fundamentals of democracy. We went on TV, radio, newspaper, billboards, and online media and reached out to millions of people in six regional languages across the country to explain in very simple terms that if, if, if somebody is selling you democracy without rule of law, freedom of expression, pluralism, free, fair, and regular elections, and private property right, it is not the democracy we are talking about. We work with the notion that our, con our contribution to the, mo to the movement is making liberty more relevant in local Nepali context and day-to-day -day lives of people. For example, 
pushed away by a culture of impunity, forceful shutdowns and strikes, and lack of security of life and property, young Nepalese have been leaving the country every day in number, numbers of over thousands seeking employment. So back in 2008, we started one of the largest privately funded grassroots campaigns in Nepal called Let Me Earn My Living. With a coalition of over, over 35 individuals and or 3,500 individuals and organizations and about 40,000 members, we, we have offices in 25 key places of the, of the country. Uh, I wanted to show you a quick um, sort of a picture on how we organize the coalitions. This is our office. Uh, who is, whoever has been to our office you know, identifies the communist flag, which is our neighboring office. So, so we're, every day, this is our inspiration, our, our staff member looking at the inspiring flag for us. Because that's, that's the mission. The mission is to change these flags into, into other flags. Um, So this is a mass meeting that we organized when uh, living in Nepal became practically difficult. There was, there was 18 days of general strike called by the Maoist party saying if, if the constitution will not be in their terms, they would stall the country. And we went around doing several of these mass meetings. And, and, and as you can see, there was, uh, we were able to bring, bring people the numbers of 50 to 60,000 in, in each of these meetings, and, 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 and the simple message was that this country should be livable enough for all of us to live there, which meant we should be able to protect our property, our freedom to enterprise, and, 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 and create a situation of rule of law. As we continue with our focus on localizing liber liberty, last year, with support from Atlas and uh, 84 generous support, supporters, were all, many of them whom are in, in this room, uh, we, uh, in, in a crowdfunding campaign, we conducted a research on, on small mom and pop stores. These shops that pervert every street faced building uh, make up for an economic phenomenon which is part of the daily life of most Nepalese, and it has rarely been studied before, let alone from the lens of economic freedom. But as of today, my colleague and I are fighting for the economic freedom of those micro and small entrepreneurs in Nepal. But it is not only the masses we have focused on over the years. We are also strategically investing on winning friends from what we call the other side. As much as we shun the evil of communism, we have not shunned individuals who have earnestly followed the ideology. We strategically reached out to selected leaders from the Maoist Party, the Socialist Party, and the Communist Party, and started conversations on topics in which we could come together. Again, entrepreneurship is always helped. We created a multi-partisan policy group called the Nepal Leader Circle in 2011 by bringing in relatively open-minded leaders across party lines, and some of whom are parliamentarians and, and many of them are central committee members of their party, to meet business leaders on a regular basis. And we would, we would communicate to the business leaders on what would be the agenda for, for our business leaders to communicate to the political leaders. So, so whatever we would like to say would come through the business leader saying, you know, this is not helping us. And this has become now, today, this has become one of the most influential policy circles uh, in Nepal. And e every other expert who is coming to Nepal is requesting us if we can have them speak in, in, in this particular forum. This group is of, of about 50 people who are kind of the most influential in, in, in policy dialogues. We also uh, strategically uh, chose to work with the Chamber of Commerce because they, they're, they're quite stronger than us. Um, and other private sector organizations in doing research and advocacy work. And for the first time uh, in 2012, we worked with the Chamber to say, let's develop an economic growth agenda for, for Nepal. And we set up an economic growth agenda and, and sort of we did all the work and, ha and had the chamber in the for, uh, forefront saying, this is what we want the economic agenda to be like. And it was heard, uh, it was perceived very positively by uh, all the stakeholders in policy. So today, uh, our, we recommended five sectors for, for growth with policy. 
four of the sectors have been adopted by the government as Nepal's priority growth sector. This makes us feel very happy. We were also able to convince the government and, and the Chamber of Commerce this year to start organizing an annual economic agenda conference called the Nepal Economic Summit. And we, we backed them up as knowledge partners so that we're able to produce the knowledge that would be discussed in, 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 the, um, in the conference. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying this, I would also uh, not forget to tell you that during the first few years of our existence, or um, uh, especially during the Maoist regime, in our annual strategic meetings, one of our most discussed upon uh, points would be uh, to develop the exit strategies for each individual. What that meant is the exit strategy would outline how each team member would be evacuated to a safer country in case of physical threats. Uh, just December last year, um, no, it was February. It was February last year. Um, the Maoist Party on the second election had, uh, had blatantly lost because of all these consequences that has happened in the, in the middle. And in February, Rainer was in Nepal to help us about the strategy. And, and there was nobody was talking about the strategy anymore. We feel safer because we have a more liberal party here, and we were able to, I think, show it to to people in in the last five years of Maoist time that Maoists are 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 no worth quoting. So they've been voted out. Uh, and and our uh, our life seems much easier and better now. But then uh, the Berlin walls in the Nepali society have not fallen completely. People struggle to make an honest living given poor implementation of rule of law, lack of safety of life and property, and excessive red tape. Um, and there are a lot of individuals who have started uh, saying, you know, if I, I cannot do anything anything legally in the past, so I, I better not register a company or not, not do it in the past. But then uh, but then the point that we're trying to make with them, including this mom and pop stores, is that we should work together to create an archive of of Nepali laws and put whatever laws that are obsolete uh, in Nepal uh, into that museum and say this these were the laws but we will we will have new laws uh, in the country that will be useful and beneficial for uh, for the entrepreneurs. I think our, our story and our small wins um, is the victory of liberty and the victory of everyone in this room today because we make it a point to come together like this and do what we can for people who live thousands of miles away, um, people whom we do not know yet we care deeply enough about their liberty to have human experience in their own terms. I would like to share this credit of whatever impact we have created in Nepal with all of you present here today and especially at, uh, to Alice Network that has always been there for us in creating learning <coughs> opportunities and linking to the much needed resources. I quickly show you other pictures just so, so that you get, get a hint of uh, what it looks like. This is our uh, entrepreneurship program. These are our students that, uh, that have benefited from the program. Uh, this is some of our numbers. These are the kind of forums we organize. Uh, this was the democracy campaign that we launched to reach out to masses of people. Uh, this is an entrepreneur. This is how people are making a living. You know, one one example. Uh, this is this is a situation where property rights was being um, uh, violated, and, and and our campaigners came out on the street with, with uh, articles, uh, the, the mom and pop stores, research. This is one of my favorite pictures. These are all the former finance ministers before the election discussing their economic agenda on the manifesto. And this was this led to a big win for us because mo most of the parties in their manifesto in, 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 the, in the recent election said, we commit to create a livable Nepal where property, right is, uh, property rights are respected, where rule of law is respected, where freedom of enterprise is respected. But the, the political parties are able to live, live to their manifesto, but I think this was, this was a big uh, win for us. <laughs> and then this is a typical situation of where a, a small vendor is trying to make his living and, and, and the police are taking all he has away from, from the person. And this is what happens normally in every two or three months uh, for petroleum because it's supplied by only one company uh, owned by the government and these are queues for um, motorcycles and taxis queuing up for petrols for several hours. 
And yes, the police traveling, street vendors. So these are some of the glimpses of what it looks like, what the situation looks like in Nepal. But then again, uh, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to sort of uh, share with you at this at this forum today that recently, um, f with our uh, livable Nepal campaign, before I came here, thousands of truckers took it out on the street and uh, and uh, and said, "We need a livable Nepal. Let us earn our living." Because the government uh, closed down some mining uh, extraction without any consultation with the, with, with with the truckery trucker industry. And we were told by the call by journalists saying, are you guys organizing that campaign there? And when we went out to see that, our campaign was taken away by them, by, by the truckers. And there were thousands of trucks lined up with our banners saying, let me earn a living. And I think that's the real success for us. Um, lastly, I'm happy to share with you that, uh, that the, the biggest thing that has happened to us since our founding in 2006 in Nepal uh, together with uh, Asia Center of Enterprise uh, and other partners, Somiti is organizing the 2015 Asia Liberty Forum in, in January. I would like to invite all our friends here and our friends around the world to uh, to to uh, be a part of the Liberty uh, Asia Liberty Forum in Nepal uh, and uh, uh, see how we are working and see what Nepal is like. Uh, thank you very much for all your support and patience. Thank you. Thank you.